Welcome back to Truth By Light. My, how things can change in a week. Last week, um, things seemed to be pretty normal, didn't they? Pretty ordinary. And this week, we find ourselves in the middle of a worldwide pandemic. One in which everyone is being asked to participate in something called social distancing. But here's the deal. We, when we were created, we were created for relationship. Relationship that allows us to stand closer than six feet from another person. Relationship that tears down walls, not puts them up. Sometimes we just need to be near those we love, don't we? But right now, we have to keep our distance. However, there's a promise from Scripture that even in these days of social distancing, we can lean on. It's from the book of James, chapter 4, verse 8. And it promises that if we draw near to God, then He's going to draw near to us. Now, that word in the Greek, draw near, we have two words for it, but it's just one word in the Greek. But for us, it means draw near. It literally means to approach or to join one thing to another. So God's promise in his word is that if you come near to him, he will join you where you are. What a promise. There's no such thing as social distancing when it comes to you and God. But that's just the first part of the verse. The second part of the verse says, cleanse your hands, sinners, purify your hearts, you double-minded, as if we needed another reminder to wash our hands, right? But here's the idea. You are stuck at home, and there aren't a whole lot of people that you can be joined to, really. And depending on where you've been, there may not be a whole lot of people who want to be joined to you or drawn near to you, but not God. He always desires us to come near to him. And in turn, he meets us right where we are. I just, I hope you'll hold on to that promise today and in the coming weeks. When that happens, we become more aware of who we really are. And we're not called just to wash our hands, even in the ceremonial sense of that phrase, but also to purify our hearts. And isn't it interesting that our hearts, in that verse from James chapter 4, verse 8, our hearts are connected to our minds, just like we talked about a couple of weeks ago in our lesson. Our mind has the power to turn off the light in our heart. In these coming days, I just want to encourage you to draw near to God. That's my plan too. And, and as we do that, let's also resolve to just come clean with Him, to purify our hearts by getting everything, all those worries and all those fears and anxieties, everything that is in our mind into His hands as many times as it takes. So let's start today with a fresh word from Romans chapter 3. That is where our lesson, our actual, you're like, oh my goodness, she's just now starting the lesson. <laughs> but, but that's where our actual lesson comes from today. Romans chapter 3. If you have your copy of God's word close by, and I hope that you do, please turn to Romans chapter 3. We're going to start with verses 21 through 23. So I hope you'll read along with me. Romans chapter 3, verse 21. But now... Apart from the law, God's righteousness has been revealed, attested by the law and the prophets, that is, God's righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, since there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we've spent three weeks <laughs> talking about the wrath of God. And can I just be transparent with you and say that when I saw those words, but now what a sense of relief washed over me because we get to turn from talking about the wrath of God to talking about the righteousness of God and not just his righteousness, but how we are made righteous, how we are justified 
Now, remember that the church in Rome was made up of Jews and Gentiles. So the Jews in the crowd, when they heard um, of God's righteousness, they might have thought, well, yeah, God's righteousness is revealed through the law. Like, I've been knowing about that for a long time, Paul. So right out of the gate, Paul makes sure that they know that God's righteousness is apart from the law, separate from the law. It's all about faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, not just Jews, but Gentiles too. Praise God. No one can expect to be made right based on the works of the law. That covenant has been superseded so that everyone has access to God's righteousness. That is some good news today. There's a new covenant, and there are actually this new covenant under Jesus Christ, there are actually six different places that I could count in the Old Testament that reference that new covenant. Um, one in particular is Jeremiah chapter 31, starting in verse 31. And it's also referenced in Hebrews chapter 8, verses 8 through 12. So if you're taking notes, you can just jot those down to go back and look at those. But these references from the Old Testament is what Paul's referring to when he says it's attested to by the law and the prophets. So righteousness is both exclusive and inclusive. Let me tell you what I mean. So it is exclusive in that it is only available through faith in Jesus Christ. But it's inclusive in that it's available to all who have that faith, Jew and Gentile alike. And then we see that last verse, Romans chapter 3, verse 23. It is quoted so much. You may have learned that as a very young child in Sunday school or um, VBS. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The reason there's no distinction between Jew and Gentile is because we are all sinners. Number one, we all sin, right? So we are all equally under the judgment of God, and rightly so. No one is excluded from that. But number two, as a result of that sin, the glory that had resulted from human beings being created in the image of God, that glory was marred, not destroyed, but marred to the point that from the time that sin entered our world as humans, Every human after that falls short of the glory of God, no matter what we do. So if we're all doomed to sin, which we are, <laughs> and we all fall short of God's glory, which we do, then how are we justified? I'm so glad you asked. Let's look at verse 24 in chapter 3 of Romans. They are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So how are we justified? Well, freely by his grace and through Jesus. Listen, this is good news. We've been seeing so much on social media like, oh, post the seventh picture on your camera roll or post some really good news that happened to you today. If you don't hear any other good news today, let me just go ahead and tell you, this is good news. This may be the best news you have heard in weeks. Just like there is no distinction in our sin before God, there is no distinction in our access to justification in Jesus Christ. That is good news. Now look, not everybody who sins is going to be justified like regardless of what they do. That would be called universalism and it's hogwash. Jesus said himself that he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life, and no one can come to the Father except through Jesus. So we have nothing to offer. We totally depend on God's grace to be justified, and it comes freely through the redemption in Jesus. Now, the Greek word redemption was often used with a term when they were talking about liberating slaves or um, buying back prisoners of war. 
so there was definitely a price to be paid. So just because Paul says that it comes freely doesn't mean that there wasn't a cost. Now, Paul uses this word only one other time. I think this is so interesting. Only one other time in Scripture, and it's in Romans chapter 8, verse 23. And it's when he connects our redemption to our adoption as children of God. Now, I don't know if you've ever adopted a baby. I have not, but I have several close family members who have. And I can tell you <laughs> with absolute assurance, adoption is not free. It is not free. Um, it costs a lot. It costs a lot of money, but it costs a lot more than money. There's a lot that goes into it. So once sin entered the world, we were slaves to sin, prisoners of a sinful worried, overwhelmed mind. But Jesus paid the price to buy us back, to give us freedom. And what was the price? Let's look at Romans chapter 3, verse 25 and 26. God presented him as a propitiation through faith in his blood to demonstrate his righteousness because in his restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. He presented him to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would be righteous and declare righteous the one who has faith in Jesus. This is so beautiful. The price for our redemption was God the Father presenting his son as an atoning sacrifice because nothing else would do. The word used here, propitiation, is only used um, one other time in the New Testament. And it's in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 5, where it describes the covering of the Ark of the Covenant, which was also called the mercy seat. And um, in the Old Testament, that was where the priest on the Day of Atonement would sprinkle the, the um, blood of the goat on that mercy seat. And that would atone for the sins of the people. All of this took place behind the curtain in the temple that separated the rest of the temple from the holy of oh, the rest of the sanctuary from the holy of holies. So it was just the high priest in there with the mercy seat, where God was doing um, the atoning for the sins. The priest was sprinkling that blood all behind the curtain. But God, Paul is telling us here, God presented. The Greek word there would mean publicly displayed. Do you not just love this? Like, I mean, are you not just loving this right now? So he didn't hide behind that curtain in the Holy of Holies. He publicly presented Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, that curtain during the crucifixion, if you remember, was torn from top to bottom, top to bottom, so that no human being could have done that. It was done by the Spirit of God only, not just as a sacrifice. It was the covering. This was something, we're done. Like we're done with the with the, the Holy of Holies. We're done with that curtain being there. God is presenting Jesus once and for all as a covering for all. I'm telling y'all, that's some good news. That's some good news. Now you'll see here in this scripture too that Paul writes, in his restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. Restraint is for repentance. That's what it's for. Restraint is for repentance. God's restraint was then and is now designed to allow people to experience the kindness of God that leads to repentance. So like we might look and go, God just doesn't see any of this sin. Like he doesn't see what's happening in this world. That is a lie from the devil. He does see it. Restraint is meant for repentance. That is the design so that people will come to know Jesus. Romans 3, 27 and 28. Let's check it out together. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By one of works? No. On the contrary, by a law of faith. 
For we conclude that man is justified by faith apart from works of law. So not all boasting is bad. Um, Paul boasted, according to Romans 5, 2, in the hope of the glory of God um, about a fellow co-worker in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and even in his own weaknesses in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We don't hear about that very much, do we? In Scripture we do, but that's not something that we very commonly do today. But boasting of one's right standing with God was excluded, and it is excluded because we don't have anything to do with it. <laughs> Faith without works is dead, but works of the law do not give birth to justification. That can only come through faith in Christ so that no one can boast. Let's look at Romans chapter 3, verse 29 through 31 quickly. Or is God for Jews only? Is he not also for Gentiles? Yes, for Gentiles too. Since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith, do we then cancel the law through faith? Absolutely not. On the contrary, we uphold the law. So the word or lets us know that Paul is changing tactics here. So he's making a shift. If someone could be justified by works of the law, what would that say about God and his sacrifice? The point of verse 29 is that God must be God of both the Jews and the Gentiles. Otherwise, the Gentiles would have no God, right? Because there is only one true God. So if God is all about justification through faith, and I mean, man, Paul is really driving this home, then he knew as he wrote this letter to the church at Rome that people would go, well, if it's just about faith, then we can throw out the law, <laughs> right? And so he asked that question, is it, is it? Like, are we just done with the law? And then he turns around and Paul says, absolutely not. God did what the law, weakened by our sin, could not do. So that the requirement of the law would be fulfilled in those who walk by the Spirit and not by the flesh. Let's look at Romans chapter 4, verse 1 as we wrap up today's lesson. What then can we say that Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh, has found? If Abraham was justified by works, then he has something to brag about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness. That's actually um, Romans chapter 4 verses 1 through 3. So as we wrap up, Paul turns his attention to Abraham, whom he kind of used as um, a test case for his doctrine of justification by faith apart from the works of law, which is, I mean, everybody kind of would have perked up their ears at that time because they would have known who Abraham was, especially the Jews. And Abraham did like, he did things that proved his faith. So you would think, well, maybe that's a little off, but Paul asked his readers to suppose, just for the sake of argument, that Abraham had been able to be justified by works. Well, he would have had the right to boast. But Paul quickly interjected that that boasting would not be before God. Now, Paul's point wasn't that Abraham was like better than everybody else, but rather that Abraham believed God, meaning he had faith, and his faith is what was credited to him as righteousness. So God made Abraham a promise, and Abraham trusted God's word. That faith was recorded in Genesis chapter 15. That came before the sign of circumcision, which was in Genesis chapter 17. It came before um, Isaac was born and they made their way up the mountain and Abraham was willing 
to sacrifice Isaac because that is what God had asked him to do. He was willing. He didn't have to, but he was willing. All of that, that being credited to him as righteousness came before those actions. It was his faith, not what he did, not what he did that was credited to Abraham as righteousness. Credited was then and is now a business term, right? So Abraham deposited his trust in God's word, and that was demonstrated by his willingness to obey God. And then God recorded that faith as a credit. And then Abraham's debt was paid in full by his faith in God. Just as ours today is paid through our faith in Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for um, technology, for the opportunity, Lord, to continue to be able to get in your word together. God, we may not be able to meet. We know we can't meet with our small groups, but God, we thank you for um, for the ability to connect to one another through your word. And God, thank you that you promise that if we draw near to you, that you'll draw near to us. God, we need you and we need more faith, especially in days like this. God, I pray that we would get into your word. God, um, that that we would believe, we would put our trust in your word from Genesis to Revelation, God that we would demonstrate our willingness to obey you even in tough days. And God, that our full faith would be in Jesus Christ. God, that no matter what we hear on television or see on our news feed and social media, God, that your word would reign supreme in our hearts, that you would just be a banner over us, Lord. And that we would remember that you are still Jehovah Jireh and you provide for all of our needs. God, thank you for this lesson. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who is the teacher. And we just commit these things to our heart today and ask that you continue to bring them to our mind. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for Truth by Light. If nothing changes and the Lord wills, we will be right back here next week with another lesson from Romans. Stay safe, keep your distance, but not from the Lord. And we'll see you next time.